We've got a great panel here to discuss a question that's facing a lot of companies right now, which is how to prevent a data breach. So I, I kind of want to start with this idea. Last month, Katie Arrington, the Chief Information Security Officer of the Pentagon's Acquisition Policy Office, was addressing a bunch of contractors. And she had them repeat after her, quote, we are all going to get breached. So with this idea in mind, is it actually physically possible to stop breaches? And I mean, we can start with you. Sure. Um, when I was back in college and I was in my first real technical job, I asked the exact same question to my boss. And uh, Jared responded to me and he said, yeah, it's possible. Um, if you take all of your computing devices, you pour cement in them, and then you dump them into the bottom of the ocean. Um, it's not a practical solution, I don't think, in this day and age. Um, but even though that was 20 years ago, it still rings true to this day. Yeah. George, your product, your tagline for your company is We Stop Breaches. Yeah, it is. And um, I think when you look at stopping a breach, uh, I think it is possible. But you know, I want to reframe that. And I think any large company is going to have an incident. And I make the distinction between an incident and a breach. Uh, an incident is, you know, you may have one computer that, that gets attacked. It may be breached, a credential theft, or what have you. But uh, can you actually contain that and minimize the impact of that so that it's an incident instead of a reportable breach? And uh, last year, we stopped about 35,000 breaches for customers. That's not just malware. That's hands-on keyboard. And I think a time element, we can talk more about this, is really important to be able to have the visibility and understand very quickly if you do have hands-on keyboard and you have an adversary, as an example. Yeah. And Georgia, you're a trained penetration <laughs> tester. You're an expert at, at making breaches happen. Right, so I simulate breaches, basically. Um, I would say that with the technology we have now, absolutely we cannot 100% like prevent breaches. Um, the attackers are going to have like the technologies, like I'll just use CrowdStrike as an example, and make sure their attacks can get past it before they ever like start throwing their attacks. Um, that said, assuming they're not specifically like targeting you, say you know if they were going after Equifax, um, if Equifax had a really like strong security program going on, they might just decide to go after TransUnion instead if theirs was not quite as as high. So there are ways to make yourself less of an exciting target. Yeah, so if, if breaches aren't preventable, I guess the question kind of becomes, what do you do when a breach happens? And we actually have a really good person to answer that question here in Jamil. I mean, you came into Home Depot after their massive data breach where 56 million credit cards were stolen. And then you came into Equifax where, you know, one of the most devastating hacks of all time happened. 147 million people's personal data was exposed. The chief information officer uh, went to jail for insider trading off of the information. And uh, I'm still waiting for my $125 settlement check. So does it become more of a question of, of you know, more securing the systems, and then it kind of becomes a cultural question of the kind of security group that you're running. Yeah, it's, um, <laughs> yeah, so I'm not even going to comment on the intro there, but um, we, so uh, the strategy here is you've got to put your best foot forward, and you have to have multiple layers of defense to be able to meaningfully stop any of these attackers. And what we've done at Equifax is, you know, we committed to investing $1.25 billion in our transformation to be able to be a leader in cybersecurity. We've hired over a thousand individuals in the cyberspace to be able to help us bolster that program. We've changed reporting lines so that my role reports directly to the CEO. And doing these things has helped us to be able to establish a culture that's sustainable, whereby everyone understands that security is their job and security is built in to the DNA of our company as a whole. Yeah, George, how do, you, how do you build a culture like that that would stop a data breach? I mean, what's, what's the most important thing for executives to focus on? Well, I think it does start at the top. And uh, you have to have a culture of security built in from the beginning, and you have to have not only an executive team, but a board that understands security. And we spend a lot of time, you know, we're a public company now, we spend a lot of time with our audit chair, who actually uh, was on the board of Target when they had a breach, right? Actually ran it for a bit after the CEO left. So we have a great culture at the top, and certainly the companies that we try to work with, um, everyone's getting up to speed. And, and I think the hard part is at the executive level and at the board level is there's just not a lot of expertise in that area. And we're starting to see more and more boards actually bring cybersecurity professionals on the board, as an example, to help them. Because if you think about it, if it doesn't start at the top, it doesn't start at the board, um, it's never going to basically filter through the organization. And I think, you know, 
uh, what we talked about here, Jamil said basically reporting into the CEO, which is a which is a big change, and I think that's reflective of people trying to move the ball in the right direction and uh, take security really seriously. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Georgia, what do you think about that? What's the kind of best way to organize a company to prevent a breach? Well, I think we have a lot of a problem where a lot of people think that, I guess, attacks are like this black magic dark arts, but in so many cases, it's something like clicking on a link in an email, which all of us can do, or maybe in a text message, or you know, not updating our software. You know, when it pops up and says you need to update Java, like clicking later, like that's what causes a lot of the breaches. So it's not like a dark magic. There is something that all of us, regardless of how technical we are, we can help stop these breaches. Yeah. And Georgia, a question for you specifically. I mean, you're an expert in, in the ways to break into the companies and. We're seeing some companies turn the corner and, and being able to prevent breaches, but at the same time, the, the attack surface or the, you know, the possible entry points for an attacker seems to be getting broader with things like IoT. I mean, is that something you're seeing? Absolutely. I think you know, as we're getting better with like, the servers and the workstations and the firewalls, we're also bringing in our mobile devices. We all are bringing our mobile devices to work. We have you know, the internet connected coffee pot. And while you might say, well, there is no corporate credit cards on the internet connected coffee pot, it is on the same network as your perhaps your database with credit cards. So if somebody attacks the coffee pot, they may be able to jump then to you know, your, your corporate servers on that same network. So definitely that's something we need to be thinking more about. Unfortunately, in my efforts, I'm seeing most companies are just kind of like pushing that under the rug at this point. But unfortunately, the attackers do not do like rules of engagement. So they will use whatever way to get in, including the coffee pot. I mean, George, is that something you're seeing where you're, you're having to help companies protect so much more kind of entry points and, and different places where data is stored? Well, I think you, you have that effect, but you also have a lot of companies that are moving to the cloud and, and moving to cloud workloads. And I think they're really struggling with how to protect those cloud workloads, how to instrument it, how to get visibility, how to really even understand all the workloads they have. And anybody with a credit card in a company can pretty much spin up an Amazon instance. So it becomes a real challenge for organizations to figure out, A, what they have visibility-wise, like do they have it and does it belong to them? And then is it configured correctly and what security is in place? And, Odds are, if it's, if it's just been kind of rogue, uh, set up by a rogue individual or not through a corporate program, it's not going to have the same level of security policy and controls on it. And you, know, you see a lot of the breaches that we've seen in the past just because things are not configured the right way. Right. And Jamil, if, if your idea for preventing a data breach is, as you said, uh, filling your server with cement and putting it on the bottom of the ocean, I think <laughs> a lot of people are, are, are thinking about, well, then, if we're expecting to get breached, how do we collect less information so, so we can kind of minimize the amount of information that could get out there? But Equifax is in the business of, of retaining that information. So is that something you're, you're thinking about? You know, how can we store less valuable information that could get stolen? Yeah, absolutely. And so first off, I'll say this. Um, security can be really complex. There's all these technologies. And I think most of us in this, in this role have come up through the ranks in with, with technology as our background. So we look for silver bullets all the time. I'm here to tell you that there are no silver bullets. Um, so focusing on the fundamental foundational controls is absolutely critical. If you do those things really, really well, really well, then you're gonna keep yourself you know, safe 99.9% .9 of the time. Now, as it relates to uh, the data, yeah, there's no question. The more data you have, the greater your attack surface. And so we've put in a concerted effort to ensure that we not just go through and discover all of the data sets and ensure that they're appropriately classified, but also to go through a business process to understand what data do we really need. And I think in most of your organizations, you probably know that there's a tremendous amount of data that just sits there because someone forgot about it or you're not using it anymore that really serves no purpose. But it's extraordinarily valuable to an attacker. And so we've gone through a process to be able to cull that so that we only keep the data that we absolutely need to operate our business. Yeah, and, and tell me about that. What have you done since coming into the company to kind of shore up its security? Oh, we could talk about this all day long. Um, so it started off with the culture. That's the most important part, I think. And we've done a great job about moving the ball there. Um, but that takes time, right? So it's, it's, it's step by step. The next piece, we really focused on the control piece. And so this is the, all the technical controls, whether it's the data devaluation piece, access management, and certainly our cyber defense in terms of detecting and responding. 
we believe, like many do, that anyone can be breached and therefore we want to be able to have the level of visibility to be able to detect and respond as quickly as possible if and when something bad happens. And then finally, we've really focused on instituting a risk-based approach into our program. So it's not just check the box compliance stuff, it's thoughtful decisions and trade-offs about prioritizations and where we can buy down the most risk based on every activity that we pursue. Yeah. And George, I have a question for you. Your company has been in the news lately. President Trump mentioned CrowdStrike in his infamous phone call with the Ukrainian president. He seems to think that there's some server that's sitting in Ukraine somewhere. I mean, it's all really strange, and I was surprised to hear him mention CrowdStrike in the transcript. I mean, what kind of effect has that had on the company? I mean, it, does it feel weird? You know, as surprised as anybody else, but um, at the end of the day, we do hundreds and hundreds of uh, incident response investigations with our technology, with our people, and you know, in 2016, we did an investigation for the DNC, and wrote a report about it, and it was validated by 17 intel agencies and everyone else, you know, uh, in between. So, you know, we wrote a blog. You can visit our webpage and take a look at it. And, um, you know, I think, yeah, where we are, where we are. We're just focused on keeping customers safe and, and building great technology. Yeah. And, and, Georgia, could you kind of talk about what the, the different threats are now? I mean, who, who's trying to break into companies and who's the most prolific at it? Well, actually, a lot of the people who are doing even successful break-ins are just, you know, somebody in mom's basement who's just, you know, trying this out. You know, you've got the hacktivists who, you know, might go after a certain political party that they don't like. Um, then you've got, you know, the nation-state level attacks where, you know, that's a bit... I sit, I'm one of the people who sits in the basement and hacks all day, so that's all a bit above me. Um, but, I mean, a lot of it is, you know, as I said earlier, not really... It's not super hard to do a lot of these attacks. You know, like the, the Equifax breach was a missing patch. There was, you know, uh, stuff on... You could Google and be like, exploit for Apache struts. So you didn't have to be a cybersecurity expert. Unfortunately, it seems like we do have to be cybersecurity experts to an extent to even securely like run our cars and our internet connected coffee pots and our home computers. But in a lot of cases, we don't have to be very sophisticated to do successful breaches. We can just Google how to do it or send somebody an email to convince them to click on something. So you know, a lot of times, again, it's really not dark magic. It could be you know anybody who you know uh, somebody who doesn't like your kid in the fifth grade like Googled how to hack and then that they attacked your company because they didn't like your kid. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and George, your, your company has an entire kind of section dedicated to threat intelligence. I mean, figuring out who the most sophisticated hackers in the world are. I mean, what are the kind of new and emerging threats that you're seeing, and, and what kind of skills do these nation state hackers have? Well, it depends on the nation states. We break it down into three categories. So we have nation state, we have e-crime and hacktivism, and uh, each country has different skill sets. In fact, we've been able to, to watch adversaries and, you know, we, we've, seen, we've seen different shifts. We had like the junior varsity come in one time, they couldn't break in, and then it was a Chinese group that brought in a different part of the Chinese government that dropped a zero-day kernel exploit, which we, we saw stopped. And, um, but you can see the differences, right? But I think one of the things that we've done is we've looked at something we call breakout time, which is, again, if someone gets on a computer, it's pretty hard to to stop all these attacks, particularly if you get fish. It's, your credentials are out there, there's no malware to stop. And how quickly can you detect those? And what we found is that on average it takes about two hours for an adversary to get on a system and then move laterally. That's on average. But if you look at the different groups, uh, it takes the Russians about 18 minutes, it takes the Chinese about four hours, and it takes, uh, in general, e-crime about nine hours to move out of there. Now, those are just generalities. I mean, some groups get on, you know, they run through their scripts, they can very quickly move laterally. But if you can identify that very quickly, hopefully within a minute and contain that, you have a much better shot of having an incident as opposed to a breach. Yeah. And Jamil, uh, there's a lot of data, data breaches that happen and they make the news and then they kind of go away. But the, the Equifax one was kind of unique in that so many people were upset about it. So many ha people had their information exposed. So what can you do to kind of convince people that Equifax is trustworthy and that they care about protecting their data? I mean, I think at the end of the day, when you make the investment that we've made, when you make the organizational changes that we've made, when you've undertaken a transformation to size and scale that we're, that we're taking, um, then it'll eventually build, build that trust back. Um, it's not something that happens overnight, but when you spend $10 million and build a, an advanced cyber fusion center, when you partner with organizations like the 
World Economic Forum and so forth, to be able to build in those tight bonds so that you can truly be a leader in the space. Um, I think that uh, over time that we will reestablish that trust. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, I think that's about all the time we have. And thanks so much to our great panel. Great, uh, thank you. For all their insight.